<laughs> All right, over to you, Bud. Okay, uh, we start our afternoon uh, set of presentations with uh, Vince Vela, KI6ASW, and he's going to discuss DX with a technician license using satellites. It should be a very interesting presentation. Thanks, Thanks man. Okay, uh, yeah, so uh, as they introduced me, my name is Vince, uh, KI6ASW. Uh, one of the things that I find most unique about this uh, hobby is that we actually have dedicated satellites for our usage. And you can actually operate those with the tech class. In fact, there are very few of them that you cannot operate with the tech class because of the frequency ranges that they use. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and uh, cover a number of topics here. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, importance of height when you get into RF uh, communications, uh, which is generally why our repeaters are somewhere high, like on a mountain. Uh, then we'll talk about how that affects what kind of antennas we need to use. Then we'll bring that back to satellites and their orbits, um, you know, they're quite high. Uh, but then you've got to have a couple of unique considerations, including the fact that these uh, satellites are in orbits that change. So we'll talk about how we can predict where they are. Um, then we'll kind of delve into what's up there and what kind of fun can we have, uh, you know, with the different modes and uh, vehicles that are up there. And then uh, we're not going to have time for the live demo, but uh, I did record a pass uh, actually using just uh, two handy talkies, uh, proof of concept kind of a thing. And then I had uh, some audio from a CubeSat pass, uh, one of the Project Fox satellites that I'll talk about, uh, that I recorded a whole conversation to show how this thing would work in practice. And then we've got a couple of links and practice suggestions if you want to work with a little bit about myself. Uh, so I love any excuse to get outside. Uh, amateur astronomy is probably one of my biggest loves in life, followed by ham radio. Uh, picked up the license right around Katrina time frame because of the emergency preparedness, but then realized there were plenty of excuses to get outside with the radio and learn. And that's where I'm at. About probably 10 years ago now, I, I learned about this ham radio 14er event. I thought, well, that makes a lot of sense. Get up on a high mountain, talk to other folks on a mountain. Um, then we moved away from Colorado for a while, and we moved back about a year ago, and I find out that the guy who invented this idea, this Ham Raider 14 event, and the club, the goat himself as well, uh, <laughs> attends our club, and it's just down the road. And so I started coming to the <coughs> club meetings, and I had a great time. Uh, that's a picture of me on top of Preston Needle. So, ham radio operators generally know the higher the better, right? You put your antenna up, the highest you can get, then you have to worry about the lightning that we were talking about. But there's a reason for this, right? The radio waves are coming out and they're going to go line of sight, skip right off of the Earth, uh, I mean, right past the Earth and go out into space. But the further up we can get before they're either hitting the Earth or going out into space, they're getting further and further away, which is uh, what this graphic is trying to depict. It's kind of hard to see. There's actually a green antenna that would be, you know, a, a smaller height, about half the height of the blue antenna, if you will, and then some geometry showing you basically where the Earth is going to start shadowing and blocking where you go, and you can see that you can cover a lot of range. As a matter of fact, uh, the coverage here on the left is the NOAA weather for our general area. They've got a um, transmitter up on Shine Mountain, and the coverage area spans all of those different counties. Uh, it's not to scale. Uh, compared to the Earth there, that whole coverage area would be about four pixels, and the mountain isn't even visible. Uh, I didn't want to scare you, scare you with the equations, but at the same time, um, it's kind of a useful thing to know that this is the equation for path loss, okay? And with all of the fancy symbols in there, basically there is one of them, that we put two of them, that we can control. The A sub 2, which is the area of our receiving antenna, so we're going to talk about antennas again and then the r squared, which is the distance, which may or may not um, come into play. So if we're thinking about the higher the better, though, um, we can start thinking about these satellites. Uh, no less than Newton had come up with this thought experiment. If I could throw something fast enough, it would move horizontally fast enough as the Earth is dropping away, and if I did that just right, it would just continue to fall moving horizontally and falling around the entire Earth. Um, he actually had mentioned a cannon on top of a mountain if there had been no air resistance and you know years later we realized this in real life. 
Um, one problem though is now we've got increased path loss and that nice tower that we're putting up high is moving on us. More scary numbers. Um, just driving home the point that there are a few things that we can control here. This is what is a uh, called a link budget. Basically, you start out with powers and you look at all your losses, you sum them all up and you try to get a certain signal power to noise and the noise is determined by physics, basically. And the key takeaways here is that the satellite has a certain amount of starting power. That 7 dB is actually very huge dBW for a um, for a satellite, we're usually working with satellites that have like a half a watt transfer. And then you've got this 154 decibels of path loss based on that other equation I was talking about. And if you think about that, that's a million billion times weaker when it gets to you. So we're talking really weak signals here with satellites. It's kind of a challenge. It's also frustrating when you're first getting into it. It's one of the things that you're gonna have to cope with, mostly by that only other plus you see there that I've highlighted, which is your antenna directivity. Which brings us to antennas. These are a number of different antennas that I've used for working satellites. Um, actually here on the left is the uh, Collins Radio Club's uh, 70 centimeter antenna. Uh, I wish I had that at home with the rotator that, that I had there. Uh, what you see here though is, is an easy to build uh, Lindblad. It's a omnidirectional, meaning it doesn't have a lot of gain. But it sees in all directions and it's circularly polarized. So if people were talking about vertical, horizontal, as long as you match the um, clockwise or counterclockwise the way that the radio waves are coming at you, and that's just a function of what antenna is on the satellite, then you don't have to worry about that. You lose like 3 dB, but then that's it. You're always pointed to right orientation. Um, so that's a very easy to build antenna. It's in the um, amateur radio satellite operator's handbook that ARRL puts out. Uh, there's plans for that. Works pretty well too. It's nice wide bandwidth. Um, up here is an axial mode helix. Uh, these antennas are easy to find plans for. And the nice thing about them is they have such a super wide bandwidth that you can get it completely wrong and it still works pretty well. Um, the challenge with building your own antennas is generally getting that match. Uh, Adam was talking about putting that wire in the right place for tuning the, uh, you know, the lowest bizwar. Well, that's usually a challenge. Um, with these antennas up here, they're mostly wide band, with the exception, of course, of the Aero antenna. That's a commercial product. Rolls up into a nice little carrying case that you could actually take a field. Uh, maybe I'd set up next to Shell. <laughs> and we'll, we'll see if uh, HF or BHF goes further. I think I know who's going to win. Um, but with the satellites, you'll see that I'm, I'm going to give them a run for his money. Uh, and then on the far right is what they call a quadrifiler helical antenna. Basically, there are plans for this thing. It's another circularly polarized antenna. The match is a little bit harder to get to this thing. Um, could go more into the details of that, but it kind of deserves its own talk. One thing that I didn't mention was, well, first of all, the table that uh, Adam was uh, talking about. I had one of those for a number of years. On a higher pass with, with satellites, your path loss is a lot less. It, it's kind of like trying to get to the drain on a swimming pool. If you're going to have a race and you can start from anywhere, you're going to move right above it, right? Well, if the satellite's orbit takes the satellite right above you, there's actually a fourth of the path loss in that thing in terms of the atmosphere that it has to go through. You just do the <coughs> bow tie geometry stuff that we had on the other slide. Um, you can use these lower gain antennas, and the J-Pole's got this nice omnidirectional pattern, and it's real easy and forgiving to build, as we've seen. So um, another one is this cubical quad antenna. Um, that's like one of the coolest uh, little antennas to build. You measure out a quarter wavelength, you make a square out of your wires with that, you put them in a, in a, on a boom together, and the thing is resonant at 50 ohms. There's no tuning of it, so if you built it correctly, there's no match to worry about, and it works fantastic. Okay, so switching gears a little bit and talking about these satellite orbits then. Um, I don't want to get too technical, so let's skip this. There's a number of uh, considerations that we have to think about. Mainly, how big is this circle? How tilted is it? How tilted is it this way? How tilted is it that way? Where is the satellite on this thing? And all of that uh, gets baked into something that they call two line elements, this little set of numbers here. And it basically defines this oval. It's just a mathematical oval. But the satellite is fixed into that oval from uh, laws of physics. And you can take that little 
uh, two line element set that you can get on the internet. So let's track that org is, a, is one place that you can get to it. And feed it into a program that will tell you what the orbit looks like and more importantly where the satellite is. Where it's going to come up, where it's going to go, and where it's going to set. Uh, that's to scale, by the way. This is a geosynchronous orbit, and this is what they call millennia. So, like, um, most of what we have are more like this. They're very close to the Earth. They are um, somewhat polar. This is actually a sun-synchronous orbit. But, uh, don't worry about what that means. It just is a class of polar orbits. They're a lot closer. So when we're working these satellites, they're still pretty far away, but you're talking like 400 miles away, not you know the 23,000 miles that the other ones are. Uh, but if you consider this orbit, the satellite's stuck in that circle and it's going around. There's another thing going around in this picture and that's the Earth, right? So the Earth is, is sitting there rotating. If not for that, that satellite would be coming over the exact same place based on this orbit. Other ones um, would be a little bit different. But because the Earth's moving, that orbit seems to move or wander or process. So we need to somehow predict where these things are. So uh, general rules of thumb before I get into how you can go and then grab these predictions. If you're looking at these satellites, uh, you're going to uh, pass at different orientations. And not only that, when you start to get over to the point where some of these satellites, instead of going all the way up to the pole, they're almost around like this one. Okay, So this one will never go higher than or lower than whatever these little points are. Okay, um, So they might be coming straight overhead of you if you're here. Or if you happen to be underneath where they're coming, They'll do a strange thing where they seem to rise at their rise and then they just stay kind of low and they cross the horizon, um, which is kind of useful sometimes. Because the footprint of what this satellite can see and who can see it, who else is underneath it, changes all the time, right? And so, kind of like when the bands are doing weird things and you get these propagation modes in different directions <coughs> and it opens up, say, Europe for you or something, we get things like this for satellites as well. You might have a higher uh, inclination pass that'll open up Canada for you, for example. Um, so another weird thing is that everything is relative to where we're looking at it. Depending on what the look angle is, things can look very different, right? If you looked at a train that was coming straight towards you, it wouldn't look like it was moving at all until it was flying past you, right? If you looked at a train that was going inside to you, then you can see that it was moving. Right. Um, these change all the ways that the satellite appears to move to you, which is important consideration when we get into the Doppler effect. It also helps you with pointing. A lot of these satellite passes, if you've got a high enough gain antenna, you can set your antenna down, walk away, and try to work the thing for the pass because it doesn't appear to move. It might come up, appear to just kind of float there, and then disappear again you know, on a really low pass. Those are the most challenging though because of the pass loss. So. Um, Another thing is uh, your apparent motion. I don't want to go into the mathematical details, but it's pretty rare to get ones that are going close to overhead. Phenomenally rare. They're the easiest ones to work in terms of path loss. So those are the ones that I would recommend when I get into the practical tips that you start with if you want to try to make sure your receiver's working. Um, but don't wait for those, because as a percentage, it's a very low amount that get above, say, 60 degrees elevation. And that's just the way the geometries work out again with all those opals. Um, I think I mentioned the attenuation, but another thing that is interesting is if you've got a satellite that has a good pass and you see it coming from the north to the south, realize that about 12 hours later we'll are on the other side of the earth and things haven't changed all that much, you'll usually get a nice north to south pass symmetric with that satellite pass. Um, and then on some of these satellites, such as this, where the footprint finally wanders off of the continent, it might be a week or two before those satellites are starting to come back over at the time of day that you want to work them again. So kind of a unique challenge. Um, uh, there's a lot of things if you're interesting that you could interested in. You can learn about why these orbits look the way that they are. Usually, our uh, ham radio satellites anymore are passengers on another payload that's got a, an actual reason for being up there, a scientific payload or something and the orbits are tuned to whatever that thing is, and that's kind of an interesting thing to know. Um, for example, you're rarely ever going to see a satellite come from the east 
to go to the west because the Earth is spinning this way. And when you launch the rocket and satellite, you don't want to fight against that, so you launch into that orbit and you generally go west to east. So this is a rendering of what these satellite footprints look like. This is the International Space Station. The further away they are, of course, the smaller the Earth appears, the larger the footprint is. Um, but you can see that on the left side here, the, the ISS can generally see you know, pretty much the whole North American continent, portions of it at least. Um, at the top, you see this weird teardrop looking distortion, and that's because that footprint is really sitting up on the pole, but we've got this 2D unfolded thing. So we need to predict these things somehow. I've mentioned that. What can we use? Well, there's a whole bunch of tools out there. First of all, you can just go to the web. Amateur Radio Satellite Organization, or AMSAT, has a website at amsat.org that gives you the satellite statuses. So uh, amateurs will feed into this little database that says, yep, I just saw that satellite. I just worked it on this mode. I got through successfully. We did the following. It's good to do that just to make sure that the satellite hasn't died. <laughs> um, then you can go over to the current pass prediction. If you know your grid square locator, anybody not know what the grid square designator? Good. So the four digit le letter um, number and letter combination gives us our latitude and longitude in nice compact format. And we actually use those on satellites quite a bit because you don't want to sit there and try to say Colorado Springs, Colorado, it takes too long. You'll see that working satellites, and when we get to the example, is a bit like these pile ups that the guys have, have mentioned. You've got the entire country in footprint, and everybody's trying to work everybody in these things. So it's a little bit more fast paced, it's a little bit interesting. You get kind of almost like these HF contests, but up here on our tech frequencies. Another one, SAT PC32 is an actual program that AMSAT has uh, developed and makes available for sale. Uh, the proceeds goes to running the organization. They uh, have to fund all of these satellite passes. It's still not that cheap to get to space. <laughs> Um, ISS Finder app is a fantastic little application that runs on our phones. The thing will determine from GPS your grid square. It'll take a database and figure out all of the satellites that you can see, and it'll tell you when they're going to come, what their paths are, and get the details. It'll even tell you frequency information. Um, just to caution, verify all that information, because sometimes that stuff goes stale, and folks haven't updated those. Do most of these things, can you get these to store on your phone without having to view them online so that you didn't have online access? That's a great question. So you can download those little numbers for most of these. Those things are good for about a week to two and then they go stale and you need to reconnect and download updated. Uh, turns out that these these approximations, all this all of this images and stuff are, are very simplistic because you only see the Earth and the satellite in this, but it turns out there's the moon and there's Saturn, uh, Saturn and Jupiter and stuff. The, the sun is the sun that we love to open up the bands on the HF, wreak havoc on these satellites and push them all around. And so um, usually you can get a reasonable approximation if you just update those, what they call Kepler's, say, within a week before you go out. Good question. Okay, so, um, oh sorry, I was halfway through here. N2YO is another amateur radio um, guy who has a great satellite uh, website out there. It's kind of like AMSATS, only it'll look at your ISP location, your, your internet address, and try to guess where you are and without even having to enter anything. Of course, you can update that. It'll start giving you past predictions. It defaults to the International Space Station. You can Google by friendly name or satellite catalog of these satellites and it'll produce um, something similar to what the AMSAT screenshots here look like. The AMSAT screenshots and even that N2YO will give you these tablature formats as well that say, yep, it's going to come up at this time and it's going to be in that direction. It's going to be at its highest point at this time and this direction. And then it will set uh, AOS um, and then max altitude and LOS. Headsabup.com is another one that's geared more towards um, Amateur astronomy, but you can use it for the uh, weather satellites, I mean the, the ham radio satellites as well. Um, and then GPredict is the GNU freeware version of a lot of this stuff, and you can go download that thing, and it, and it works fantastic. In fact, that one, 
That one uh, is geared also towards amateur radio operators. Um, the guy who wrote this is a ham radio operator. He wrote the um, SDR software that's the Linux version of SDR Sharp if you've played with any of those tools before. And this will calculate your Doppler offsets as well, which is a nice segue. Okay. So radio waves generally just go out on the surface of a sphere. And this is back to that weird equation I showed with the R squared factor in it. If you thought about how much paint you'd need to say paint a uh, golf ball, right? Maybe a little thimble pull or something, right? If I made that golf ball 10 times bigger this way, you know, now it's, it's kind of like a big beach ball or something. Would I need 10 thimbles? I'd need way more than 10 thimbles, probably like 100 thimbles, right? Because these radio waves go out in all directions and they go out on the surface of these spheres, basically. Which isn't a problem when you're moving. When you are moving and you're starting to move about as fast as the um, speed of the wave is, you start to catch up with the wave in the direction that it's moving. So uh, what that looks like is more wave fronts per second, or on the other side, less wave fronts per second. And of course, this is known as Doppler shift. Uh, we've heard of that. Uh, the classic example is the train horn, where its pitch changes as it's you know as it goes by you. And it seems like the frequency has changed because actually the frequency literally has changed. Okay, We need to account for that because when you're going up on a, a ham radio satellite, usually it's these Mopi or MoJ. <coughs> you're going up on either 70 centimeters or 2 meters and vice versa coming down. 70 centimeters is um, a lot more waves per second and it's affected by this Doppler a lot more because of that. So as a percentage of the speed of light, basically, as your frequency gets higher, your Doppler shifts get higher. The upshot being you could be tuned center channel and not be making it into the passband uplink or downlink at all, depending on how the satellite's moving. Okay. Less of a problem on two meters. Most of these charts will show you if you're downlinking on two meters, you set it to the center frequency and you forget it. And it also is a function of those geometry. So I was talking about how the train might look depending on where it's going. If the motion is towards you, you gotta worry about it. You can see above the A and B there, um, the Doppler isn't really changing at all. So if you happen to be perpendicular to the way things are moving, Doppler shift isn't a consideration. That's why if you've got a lot of gain and a lot of power to push through, those lower passes are actually some of the easiest ones. You set the antenna and point it there and forget it and then you set your frequencies and there's no Doppler or less to worry about. And then one more thing, I know I'm killing you with technical information here, but, and then we're going to move on to, to what we can do with this stuff more it's fun, but I find the technical stuff kind of challenging and unique as well. We've got this thing called polarization, and we talked about this where if a vertical is, is sitting upright, then you've got vertical polarization, but you can turn that thing like a dipole on two ends here, and that'll be horizontal. The thing that's important about that is if you try to receive a vertically polarized wave with a horizontally horizontally polarized antenna, you're going to get 100 times loss in there, a 20 dB cross polarization mismatch is what they call it. With satellites, the polarization is changing just because it's sitting there moving on us. Imagine that the satellite is going along the equator and those antennas are, I mean those arrows are an antenna pointing at us. Well, it seems to be rotating, and that's for a satellite that's fixed on us. Okay, the newer ones are about four inches cubed. I mean, you can literally hold them in your hand. I've got a picture of that coming up. And when you have something that small, you generally don't waste the space on keeping things pointed at the earth, so they're just tumbling. So polarization becomes very important. There's one way around that. You use this circular polarization, and you get both vertical and horizontal on the antenna. It's a property of that. Okay, funner part of the talk then. So, so what's up there? What can we work with here? Well, the International Space Station, hopefully you, you've all seen it. If not, go on those websites, get prediction, and go check this thing out at night. It's one of the brightest, if not the brightest, stars in the sky that appears to move. As a matter of fact, this thing is so big that through a smallish telescope, you can see shapes on this, which I, I think is pretty cool, blows me away. Something that humans built down here on the planet is big enough to see now from the planet. Yeah, Shell. I get an email from NASA whenever it's in sight. It's yeah. only it's going to be over a ten times at this time frame at this angle, and you can go outside and just take a look at your naked eye. Yeah, 
<laughs> and so now you can watch this thing, and that's that's fun. That's cool enough. They've got ham radio stuff on this thing, okay? For a couple of different reasons. If you time it right, and there's something called the ARSS um, fan site, and they'll publish schedules for this, you'll hear the astronauts talking to students. They schedule these predefined passes to talk to kids and get them excited about science and technology. And um, that's pretty rare. There's one coming up, I think, next month that I saw on the schedule, but it's out in Florida, so I doubt we'll be able to see it from here in Colorado, but occasionally you get lucky. Okay, once in a blue moon great while, I've never heard it personally ever doing this thing, you will get an astronaut on there actually just doing QSOs and, and how cool is that? You will get a QSL part from an astronaut, yeah. right? Um, uh, they also then just have this uh, simplex uh, frequency that you can send up packet radio, the old AX25 tone modem digital mode, okay? And what's cool about that is you can encode your location through something called APRS, Automatic Packet Position uh, Radio Service, right? And uh, you send out this packet, you can watch the dot moving that you're sending to and point your antenna if you're doing it manually and it happens to be a visual pass. You don't need a huge amount of gain for the ISS though. It actually is one of the easier ones to work. It goes up two meters and then a couple seconds later you'll hear a packet that's you again going down. Somebody is listening down on the ground is connected to the internet, just like in Echolink, will forward that over to a database and up pops your position on a map through space, which I always thought was kind of cool. Um, and then occasionally uh, they turn on this automatic television transmission. So there's talk in the future they're going to have pictures from space and they're going to send down pictures from space. Unfortunately, I haven't worked that out yet. What they have done is um, sent these QSL, remember the QSL cards. This was actually the Russians sending out something uh, for the commemoration of uh, Yuri Gagarin. So it was like 2011, which is why you see the 2011 on there, was 1960 to, to 2011, the 50 year anniversary. And then a couple of years later in 2015, they fired it back up. They did it again here in July. They're talking about doing it again. They change these QSL cards. I download link these, that's why they're not, you know, the best quality with my little handy tuck radio. So I thought it was kind of cool. But what else is up there then? We've got FM foam repeaters. There's like a repeater in the sky. They've got really non-standard splits because you're going up on one band and coming down on another band. But they act just like a repeater. Alright? Um, I'm not going to lie, they're, they're a little challenging, and these are the easier satellites to work, okay? Lately they've been building these CubeSats, like I was saying. This is one of the uh, engineers at AMSAT who went to Silent Key recently. Um, so uh, they had a picture of him before they had launched that. He actually was able to, to work this satellite that he got to work on. Um, and he's holding that is a life-size scale of this CubeSat. And it works fantastic. If you're only worrying about downlink, that satellite, which is um, AO85, they call it FOX1A, will break squelch on my radio on higher passes without any gain if, it, if it's coming over from a little thing that's about that big. Well, actually, I, I mean, Jim was uh, breaking squelch on SO50 in the parking lot that one time after Jonathan gave that, that talk. And so if you want to just get into this and see if it's, it, it excites you, Go find a high pass, tune to it, and see if you can't hear it. Um, AO91 up there is another one of these four inch square form factors in a slightly different orbit. Um, they host payloads on these things too, which is kind of cool. So universities have developed scientific experiments on this, I'll get into that, uh, that you can downlink telemetry from and information if that's more of your interest. AO91, AO91 has a very sensitive receiver on the satellite. And with Andy talking, you can work that thing. And I've got a recording of that coming up here shortly. SO50 is kind of the same way. Very um, sensitive receiver. Not the most powerful uh, transmitter, but you can easily work both of those on uh, HTs. The one on the right here was uh, Echo, they call it, AO51. And I worked, uh, you know, like a dozen or more states plus Canada and Mexico on that thing, just using a uh, Radio Shack handheld scanner for the downlink and the VX7R handy talkie five watt on the uplink, um, and a little bit of help from my XYL pointing. If that's not love, I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. 
And then there are other ones up there that if you've got a little bit more power to get through, their transmitters, I mean, the receivers aren't as sensitive. Um, there's no lack of satellites up there to work. So here's a practical example of these FM phone ones. Uh, at first, we'll hear this pass that I picked. Uh, so one of the challenges that I'm not gonna lie about getting on there is that you can be getting through just fine, but there's a pile up. These are FM transponders. They capture the strongest one, or it becomes a garbled mess like we saw in the repeater demonstration, and you won't get through. Um, I stayed up super late to pass that nobody would be on, and I had the satellite to myself and uh, recorded this. Hopefully it works. Except for if you're going to stand close, which I highly recommend because you want to be able to hear yourself and people answering to you, um, employ something like uh, these filters. Go find a filter for the bands that you're at because effectively you're listening for these super weak, again, a million, billion times weaker than a quarter watt downlinks coming over here. And you're transmitting with this blowtorch five watts going into some gain over here. And I had like five dB of gain, so I'm not talking a huge amount of gain here. It was less than 50 watts, right? The guys driving around with their rigs in the car generally have more power than I had used to work that satellite. The problem is, you're so close, they, they call this cosite. You can actually get a lot of power coming over on a different band. And you've got this super sensitive thing and you can blow things up. So just be careful, filter. Um, next recording we're going to hear is uh, more static and, and squawk here. It looks like I'm okay on time. Uh, you'll hear a QSO that I transcribed over here on the right. And basically this is what a satellite pass sounds like in real time. And you'll see it's, it's, it's pretty busy. So. Maybe. Yeah. So let me try to click on So he's in Canada. So it's got still. If you hit the 790, you try to get back in there on my mind. This was no special pass. I just grabbed it out of Iowa Funcher Recordings because you can actually pick off telemetry on, you know, we use CTS, CTCSS tones to get into repeater. These guys are using CTCSS tones to send really low data rate information about the satellites. And I've got it 
an image of that as well. I went back and found one from February and found this pass. Um, and here, just in that, where I didn't hand pick it, we've got you know Canada all the way down to Texas. Um, I noticed he threw his call in there about right here at the last minute. More than likely, the satellite was uh, setting for him, and he decided I'm going to go for broke one more time here. And then at the very end here, we start hearing Texas, right? And the satellite's probably about overhead right here. And so these guys are now working each other just fine. California probably only had a couple of seconds left to, to work quicker tell of it. So um, kind of interesting stuff. I downloaded all of that using uh, one of those RTL SDR Chinese dongles, $20 with a little LNA out front, $40 downloading station. You can receive all of this stuff. Is it possible to, to have contact between the east and the west coast? It is, but it's got to be just right. So um, depending on what satellite it is and where they are, get back to that thing, right? Yeah. You can see that it's you're not going to do it up at the north on ISS. But there are other satellites that are up higher that can see the entire continent. In fact, people have worked Europe through A07, for example. And how typically how long are you talking about? Sorry, footprint be over. How long that footprint be over you? Good question. So on the worst ones, like 10 minutes. Good. You've got 10 minutes horizon to horizon, um, and then on a typical one, 15 minutes to if it's one of these phase threes like A07 or something, you've got an hour more. Thanks. Um, so let's see. This is a, an example of Doppler shift downlink, but there's a bunch of science projects that you can get in there. Um, Air Force Academy actually built a neat little satellite that then they handed over to the ham radio uh, community and said, here, have fun. And this is um, its carrier. Uh, as it was going through, this is 70 centimeter, and it started out higher, and then the Doppler went lower, just like the train going by. Uh, I see a lot of APRS through this satellite, not a whole lot more. This is an example of the telemetry that I could get off of that audio file that I was talking about. They'll trend on those lower tones. This is called a phase plot or an eye diagram, and data is actually being sent over this. And they're telling me things like, here's how hot the satellite is, you know, whether or not things are still alive. There's actually um, scientific payloads on here that you can click to, and the universities let us participate. You downlink this, you send it to them, and they're happy because they've gotten telemetry where they couldn't otherwise have seen the satellite. What do you need? Again, for my receive setup, RTL SDR dongle, $20 shipped, cheap Chinese LNA, 10 bucks, maybe a filter out front if you've got a lot of large uh, signal you know, FM stations nearby. And then the arrow antenna, of course, with VX7R. That was my downlink in the clip that we heard. This was my uplink. That was a homebrew 70 centimeter antenna. You can actually use these arrows. When you get a little bit better, you can just use one radio and turn it again. You can't hear your own downlink. I do not recommend that until you get really good at it because you'll be stomping on folks and they'll get mad if you aren't really getting through. So seriously, what do you need? Well. Full duplex, right? If you had one radio like the, um, the UCUFT, you forget what it is, uh, you can actually monitor the different band. And I don't mean dual band like on our handy talkies where if you're not transmitting, you hear the other band. I mean you're hearing the other band as you're transmitting. Super helpful. That would be my first upgrade. And then maybe a much better antenna. I think I've overstressed that. And then probably a little bit more power. A lot of these folks are working from a shack where they've got you know, a fixed setup and you're not going to win on the pileup. Uh, and then uh, your receiver, get a better low noise amp, and then circular polarization, and then maybe fully automate the whole thing. I've never had an antenna rotator, and I still work these things a lot. <coughs> we heard how it worked in practice. I'm going to skip this so we'll have time for uh, some, some questions here. If it isn't working, I've got some lists. These will be up on the website of you know, maybe you should give it a try. Again, we've got a little four inch cube and we're working DX over thousands of miles with these things. It's not meant to be easy, but hang in there. It's totally doable. A couple of links and I'll uh, take questions here. We got about five minutes left. Stunned silence. <laughs> I knew I shouldn't have put that equation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm looking at building a. Uh, Tape measure Yagi? Yeah. Something like that, maybe? Definitely. Could do it? Yeah, that's, uh, your tape measure plans will be exactly like that arrow antenna. They, they basically use a three element uh, Yagi. Uh, I guess I gotta go way back to find it. You'll end up building that guy. And it'll work just as well. Yeah. Is there any opportunity to like uh, 
satellite operation parties in the area? Or? <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. That's a good question, though. There's a group online called Satnogs that are trying to do like an, a, a worldwide general ground station to track all of these and just forward telemetry. AMSAT will take this. When you decode all of that imagery, it'll automatically send all of that back to the, the operators there too so that they can trend how their satellites are, are behaving over it because things do wear out eventually. Nope, let's not listen to that squad again. By the way, I knocked the noise down a little bit on that. You will generally open up your squelch so that you can hear even the weakest stuff come in. And it is kind of annoying. I recommend headphones. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, since I got, yeah, go ahead. Just, just, just quick, have you played with that where you download the NOAA uh, yeah, maps? Yeah, that's what I was just going to go since we got two minutes. Here's another thing that you can do. You can tune to VHF and download a low uh, resolution, four kilometers per pixel image from the weather satellites, okay? It's an, a, a 40 kilohertz wide FM band, so most of our handy talkies will let you listen to about 137 megahertz. You'll open it up to wide FM so that you'll be getting a little bit more noise than you absolutely can. If you've got one of those RTL SDR dongles, you can tune all of that down and sync it up right nice, and you'll listen for an analog signal. It's got this really annoying beep, 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 beep noise. Well, that beep is a carrier that's being analog modulated with a whole bunch of digital information on top of it. These are examples that I, that I downlink, like uh, here's one when we were back in Iowa. Lately, I've got a whole bunch of QRM. If you see this, this is your power names. I found one arcing pole, but I can't find the other one. Um, but this was like at sunset, which was pretty cool, I thought, and this is like a standard if you do it right, you can get these beautiful pictures because it combines two different sensors and gives you a color image. You can even see kind of the vegetation in here. Yeah, and so that one, you know, I'd say uh, if you really want to do that one, go get one of those RTL SDR dongles and get the air man filter picture. This is for airplanes. You can listen to airplanes with those as well. Um, but it works great for those NOAA satellites. So this will set up about $50 or less if you go look for a deal on it, and you can download that. But you mentioned the, uh, like a two meter filter. What, who's, whose filter are you using when you get those? Yeah, so there's a lot of good, um, two meters is good enough that you could wind your own. This one uh, was called Hobby PCB. And if you Google that, they made a nice little one. It was like 40 bucks. Chip. Um, is it adjustable or, or it just No, it's just got a fixed band pass on two meters and mm -hmm. fairly nice roll off. I want to say it's like a fifth order. Any other questions? Well, thanks, guys. Thank you.